The New England Nursing Informatics Consortium, also known as NENIC, is the premier resource for nursing informatics, networking, education, and information exchange in the New England area. On May 9, 2014, NENIC presented their 12th annual symposium, Trends in Clinical Informatics, A Nursing Perspective. The theme of this symposium, What's Working in Nursing Informatics Today? An impressive group of local and national informaticians were assembled to address this theme in the context of nursing informatics. If you have any questions, suggestions, or need additional information, email the NENIC Program Planning Chair at program at nenic.org. Please enjoy this encore independent study and learn more about NENIC at nenic.org. Great, thank you very much. Um, and I'd just like to say on behalf of Patty and myself, thank you for the opportunity to do this project. It is, you know, it's an exciting, it's a fun project to do because you actually do get to read you know, research articles that you wouldn't have necessarily seen, um, and, and always good to, you know, know what's out there. <laughs> so neither Patty or I have any conflicts of interest to report. So today we're going to review the um, literature review that we did, so we'll review how we did that literature, review the methods that we used. Um, and then some of the actual studies from that literature. So we'll also highlight some gaps that we, that we noted from looking at this literature and discuss opportunities for translating informatics evidence <clears throat> excuse me, into clinical practice. So the purpose of this project was to survey the published literature in the areas of nursing informatics. We were specifically looking at research articles. So this included systematic reviews, randomized control trials, observational and qualitative research, and case studies. The focus was on informatics, nursing informatics. Um, and these were studies that were published in 2013. And we include um, early e-published uh, publications as well. So we'll describe the corpus of publications that we found. Um, and we'll show you some, uh, some graphs describing the uh, countries that the authors were from, the settings that um, these studies took place in, and the topics for them. So of course, our search strategies, which are very important. Um, we searched uh, using PubMed. We searched using the terms nursing informatics, and we also thought, um, and research, of course, and we also thought it was important to include the term interprofessional because we wanted to make sure that we were being a bit more comprehensive um, to find any studies that also included other professionals and nursing. Um, so our inclusion criteria, which you know, kind of um, spoke to a bit already, was research articles, articles that contribute to nursing informatics knowledge base, prototype development and testing, a clinical care delivery focus, and informatics. We chose to exclude articles that focused only on informatics education programs, nursing education, nursing students, and competencies. So we really wanted that clinical care focus. So these are our results. We retrieved 153 articles from our PubMed search, and then eight articles identified by NENIC membership. Um, and then we excluded from that amount 113. And so th this exclusion was because they weren't research focused or they had to do with nursing education or nursing students or competencies. So then that remaining 48, we read them all and assessed them for eligibility again. Um, and so those were all included in, in our study. So a total of 48. So these are the journals that those articles came from. Um, and the number one was CIN, um, and so 19% of them came from that. And then next was IJMI, International Journal of Medical Informatics, 8% um, from JAMIA, 15% 15, 15 from Studies in Health Technology Informatics, and then almost half were from other journals. And these were nursing journals and other informatics journals as well, so in a fair amount of um, nursing journals. Countries of the first author, so uh, well over half were from the US. And uh, Germany had um, a, a, a small amount there in Taiwan at 11% and the UK at 4%. So these are the research settings and the topics. And we're going to go more into more detail for these as well um, to show the percents that each of them fell into. So I won't, I won't read everything right now. So uh, almost half took place in the hospital setting. 
about 20% in ambulatory or community care setting. 13% were expert panels. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll speak to a couple of those studies and highlight them. The 7% that were other, a lot of those were surveys. 7% um, in long-term care and then 5% which were looking across the continuum of care or public health focus. So these are the research topics. So um, you can see that the most popular was standards and terminology. Very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, information seeking. And we, we had this category of information seeking, information needs, and information appraisal. So we grouped those together. And that was at 13%. Mobile health was 10%. So maybe you know, next year we'll see even more of those. Um, and, and, then, and then the rest of them kind of fell into this group of about 6 to 8%. A few of them were in that. Um, human factors and usability at 8%. Uh, hopefully, we'll see more data mining studies emerging. And, um, and, uh, and, and you know, perhaps I, I, I kind of think that mobile health will, will also be you know, that next one that really takes off. And patient engagement as well. So now to highlight some of the publications. So there were a total of 48 studies, but we're just going to highlight a subset of them um, per each category. So patient engagement. So this was a really interesting study. They looked at, so the title of it is Tailored Care Management with Patient-Centered Web-Based Portal and Primary Health Care, Sustaining a Relational Context. So they were actually looking at what is some past research about conceptual models, but essentially the patient-provider relationship and how that should be and how that should look. And then they were looking at, well, we have web-based portals for patients now. And so do those two things fit? Are they doing, you know, whatever that conceptual model says the relationship should be between the patient and the clinician, are our portals reflecting that? Um, and their conclusion, and this is a very foundational um, preliminary study, their conclusion is no, not really. <laughs> um, so our portals right now are very static. They provide information to the patient. There is some, you know, communication exchange, but not to the extent that we perhaps should really be getting to. It should be much more dynamic and communication focused between the patient um, and the provider. So there's probably more to come in this area um, over the next few years. <clears throat> information seeking needs and appraisal. So uh, this was a study, um, information needed to support knowing the patient. So this was a really interesting study. Um, for those of you that you know, have been practicing nurses, um, you know when somebody says, oh, do you know this patient? Have you taken care of them before? Well, this study looked at what does that really mean, knowing the patient? And then how do nurses know the patient? Um, so what they found when, and they were interviewing nurses to understand this. Um, so what they found about um, what does it mean to know the patient? Well, that is comprised of clinical knowledge, clinical data about the patient, but also personal information. And it's really blending the two so that you can deliver personalized care. So you're not just treating the blood pressure, but you're treating it in the way that works best for that patient. <clears throat> and this is written by Anenic member. Yes, thank you. And this is written by Anenic member. Yay. Yes. Thank you. Um, and they, and so probably could speak much better to it than me. <laughs> um, but what they found was that there were various information sources that the nurses used to gather this information. They talked to, this was in a pediatric ICU, so they were primarily talking to family, you know, parents, essentially to get that personal level of information. They did look at the EHR to get that clinical data. But neither of those sources were you know, complete in and of themselves. So they were really looking, they were using these paper-based tools. They were kind of like their handoff tools um, <clears throat> for that knowing the patient information. And it seemed to be because it blended, it brought, it, it synthesized and brought that information together. And so <clears throat> you know, how can we use this for our informatics work? Well, it can probably inform maybe how we can better design e the EHR and where there are points in which we can integrate that personal information that's important to convey um, you know, about who the patient is. And so, so the nurses were looking for areas in the EHR that they could actually put in more um, free text data, you know, so some, some narratives about 
you know, what it is the patient needs. And so that's why they were using this paper-based note, it seemed, because it allowed them to kind of explain that information. <clears throat> so this um, it was examining health information seeking behaviors of older adults. And so this was a survey of older adults in 11 retirement communities to see who they go to for information and how they get their information um, and what sources they trusted. So um, <clears throat> there was an okay response rate at 27%. They had some interesting findings that uh, the, greater, the patients with greater economic status were associated with having greater trust in providers, but less desire for information and informed decision making. Um, so interesting. Um, the providers were the number one trusted resource. And in, the internet was down towards the bottom at number six. Um, and then what was interesting is the most common sources used were number one providers and number two, the internet. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think the take home is probably, it, it may benefit older adults if, if we have some e-health literacy efforts, you know, to, to help them engage and understand, you know, how best to utilize the internet. Mobile health. So this is, um, this is a very needed publication. I know that Patty has been using it in her current work. So standardized app-based disinfection of iPads in a clinical and non-clinical setting, a comparative analysis. Um, of course, we need to know, you know, the disinfection techniques that we're using now for iPads or any mobile devices, do they work? Um, do we need something else? So when you think about doing a comparative effectiveness study of trying to see if when we have iPads on a clinical unit, if we disinfect it, does that work? Well, what are you gonna compare it to? Um, you can't give a nurse an iPad and say, don't disinfect for a week and we'll see how much bacteria ends up on it. That is probably you know, not a good idea and probably not ethical either. Um, so what they did was the, the comparative group was informaticians. So they're working in an office somewhere. And so they were not disinfecting those 10 iPads. Um, so it's not a perfect comparison, not you know, the exact same group. But what they found was that the ones on the clinical unit that were disinfected had a 2.7-fold lower bacterial load um, than the ones that were used in the office and were not disinfected. So you could probably conclude that disinfection is working very well. The ones that were in the office without being disinfected would probably have even higher bacteria. So, you know, we should disinfect. And, and, and the method that they use to disinfect is likely a good one. Um, one note was that um, their disinfection procedure may lead to losing the manufacturer warranty. So something I guess we need to consider and maybe talk to the companies about. Uh, so this one's mobile health-based approaches for smoking cessation resources. So this is a study um, that came out of Columbia University, and it was using the National Cancer Institute's Cancer Information Service in a mobile platform with decision support. Um, they found that it was um, perceived as useful um, and somewhat useful by 60% of the nurses. It was used with high frequency. Info buttons on it were used about 1,500 times, um, and then the Cancer information service referrals were used about 122 times, which was greater than in the pre-intervention group. So the reason they thought this worked really well is that it was embedded into the workflow and it was mobile. <clears throat> Standards and terminology. So this is a series of studies on um, the use of nursing terminology. Nursing terminology. So how are they used, and um, you know, and and uh, how how do nurses feel about that essentially? Mm -hmm. Um, and so what they asked was, do you feel comfortable using nursing terminologies, and do you feel you have adequate education for it? So um, what they found was that the education was lacking a bit. Um, there, for some of the, di it differed by terminology, but overall, um, the, the education initially was not that great, and then the follow-up education was not that great. Um, and so just the conclusion really is that just using the terminology is insufficient. You need good education you know, ahead of time and then ongoing as well. And as might be expected, <coughs> nurses that were working in informatics were more familiar with terminologies and using them. So this study is out of Brazil, and it's attributing fuzzy values to nursing diagnoses and their elements, the specialist's opinion. 
Um, what they were trying to do here was trying to figure out if for our nursing terminologies, we can, you know, what methods work to refine them and to standardize them. So um, they were using NAND International, which has diagnoses and then, and then the characteristics for those diagnoses. Um, the defining characteristics, you know, so what assessment data would say that you have that diagnosis. And so they were asking an expert panel, at, um, they were nursing ac experts of which, you know, characteristics map to which diagnoses to see if it was a way that could work so that we can better standardize our terminologies. And they found that it worked very well and perhaps it could be, you know, um, scaled up a bit in, in a more automated uh, manner to, to do that. So they were just, at, in a way, they were just surveying. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this one is informatics, the standardized nursing terminologies, a national, oh, did I click back? <laughs> I think I'm clicking, I'm going backwards. Okay, I think we're good now, right? Nope. I'm still going backwards. The mouse is reversed, it's left. Was I? I haven't been going backwards this whole time, have I? <laughs> okay, good, here we go, data mining. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a study that I did uh, with colleagues from Columbia University. So this was actually based on a clinical hunch that I had from working um, at, in the CCU at MGH years ago. So I no noticed that I tended to document more frequently when I was worried about a patient. Um, so what we looked at were in the nursing flow sheets, we looked at how frequently were nurses documenting vital signs and, how fre and these optional comments. So you can right click and just put a comment next to like a blood pressure and oxygen saturation. Um, and we knew the bare minimum that they had to document vital signs. So we knew when they were optional. And we found that that was associated with patients' mortality in the hospital as well as the likelihood of having cardiac arrest. Interestingly, in acute care, the patients had the worst outcomes, so more documentation. They were more likely to die and have a cardiac arrest. In the ICU, they were less likely to. And so we think it has something to do with communication, rapid response, getting you know, the whole team together and acting on the patient quickly and efficiently. And so it could have implications for, you know, this, this is still preliminary, but for um, building some good risk assessment scales and, and also mobilizing uh, you know, efforts to um, um, you know, act, act on patients that are at risk. So transitions and handoff. Um, so this one is using Aura, a network analysis tool to assess the relationship of handoffs to quality and safety outcomes. Um, so so this, was, this is an interesting handoff study. There have been a lot of handoff studies over the past few years. What this one looked at was what's the communication, the, what's the type of communication that happens between the nurse and other members on the care unit? And does that have an impact on various outcomes, safety outcomes and process outcomes? And what they found was, yes, it does. There's a relationship there. I, I shouldn't necessarily say impact, but there's an association there. Um, but it's different, so there can be different communication networks going on. I'm talking to different people, and that has an association with falls. And then there's some, some other type of communication dynamic, and that has an association with medic medication errors, you know, preventing them, hopefully. Um, and so this is interesting because it's not necessarily one size fits all for um, increasing the effectiveness of our communication, and then we have great patient outcomes. It, it seems to me that we need to look much more specifically at the data and what the right inter communication interventions are for particular outcomes. This one is nurses as knowledge workers. Is there evidence of knowledge in patient handoffs? Um, and what they found was that there was evidence of knowledge in patient handoffs. There was no wisdom in it. So they used the, the framework of, <laughs> yeah, I know, that sounds bad to say, um, <laughs> um, of data, information, knowledge, wisdom. Um, so there, you know, there's that information exchange, then there's that knowledge exchange with some clinical judgment, but they just didn't yet get up to that wisdom. But, but what they found is that the nurses weren't talking about um, they weren't linking in the plan of care, and they weren't linking in the patient's nursing diagnoses and the patient's goals. So it was still much more at that kind of information exchange. And perhaps as we start to build handoff tools, we can try to promote that type of discussion more.
Thank you, Sarah. And like Sarah, I'm, I, we, I really had a lot of fun uh, going through all these articles and uh, preparing this project. Um, so for the CPOE, EMAR, and uh, BICMA um, group, we found a paper out of Maine Medical Center. Is Nancy Glover here? She may be um, a NENIC member. She is a NENIC member, yes. Okay, so NENIC member paper. This is a great one. Challenges implementing barcoded medication administration in the emergency room in comparison to medical surgical units. And what, um, what she found in her practice was that the um, BICMA was being used much more consistently on the med surg units. And what she wanted to do was find out why. Why wasn't it being used in the emergency department? And so um, what she found was that most of the medication orders that um, in the emergency department were verbal orders. Many of them had to be administered by physicians, but the physicians were not allowed to use the BICMA system. Um, they also had... Um, uh, an issue with the way the medications were configured in the medication library. So it was causing a lot of extra alerts and alert fatigue so that the nurses were ignoring those. Um, they also had a lot of hardware limitations. The scanner they were using only worked on certain surfaces. The batteries were always dying. So <laughs> I, I guess in conclusion, there were a lot of issues with this system. And um, I think that Nancy Glover did a really fabulous job identifying them. And you know, I think there's lessons here for usability. You know, we can. I don't know how this even worked on the on the med surge unit, or whether because of the environment, it was easier for them to get things recharged or replace batteries. But you know, we need to not only just look at the technology, but we have to look at where we're implementing it, and sometimes make some adjustments. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you for that information. Yeah, so that's really the whole point. Like with these poster presents, there's fabulous work out there. So the next step is writing it up. So I wish Nancy was here, but I really love that paper. Um, let's see, am I going the wrong way? Okay, implementation. So um, this is a paper out of uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, transitioning from a computerized provider order entry and paper documentation system to an electronic health record. Expectations and experiences of hospital staff. I like this paper because I think there are a couple things in here that are useful for those of us who are doing implementations. One is this survey, so the Information Systems Expectations and Experiences Survey. So they use that to measure healthcare workers' perceptions, expectations, and experiences regarding how work processes, patient-related safety, and care were affected with this, um, with this new system. Um, one of the things that I love about this paper, though, is that they looked at the survey and they said, well, I don't know if this is really going to work for our population, but instead of just changing it, like, many of us just do with surveys, they realize that survey development is a science. And so they implemented the survey um, and did baseline measurement, they did follow-up measurement, and then they used those data to improve the instrument. And they did a psychometric analysis and published those data as well. So this was, I think, a really great example of some very well done work. Uh, under evaluation and compare, uh, comparative effectiveness, this is a paper out of Japan, Effective Information and Communication Technology on Nursing Performance. So, you know, one of the things that stands out about this paper is, first of all, there aren't a lot of evaluation or comparative effectiveness papers out there, so this is one of the few that we found. Um, what they found was that, uh, well, first of all, what they wanted to do was to investigate if there was an influence of uh, information and communication technology use and skills on nursing performance. And they found that nurses who scored high on use of information communication technology tended to also score high on interpersonal communication, and they also scored high on dis six different aspects of nursing role performance. 
they found this um, significant negative correlation um, between cell phone use and poor nursing performance. <coughs> now, it was a sort of a low uh, correlation, so it could just be anomaly with this one site, but they, they recommended that we should provide education to nurses that includes both information um, communication technology that includes both computers and telephone use because they found that as nurses' skills improved with that, that their performance improved overall. And that um, for nurses that had poor information communication technology skills, that their nursing performance did not improve. So there was some kind of a linkage. And then under technology development, this is a paper that our team published last year on um, building and testing a patient center electronic bedside communication center. And this was the prototype that we used um, that our poster out there is based on, and we're gonna be talking more about it in the panel later. But what we tried to do is identify the core set of information that patients and family need to engage in the plan of care and to start to see, you know, how would we build out that portal? And then we did bedside usability testing with patients to get feedback. Um, and so, you know, our recommendation is that an iterative participatory design approach where using qualitative methods and evaluation is really useful to inform these tools, that you do get something that we think is a bit more usable when you're finished. Um, there were several papers over the past year um, that related to health information exchange. Is Andy Phillips here? Andy Phil Yay, Andy. Andy was first author of two of them and I think co-author on a couple others. Um, this paper is Implementing Health Information Exchange for Public Health Reporting, a Comparison of Decision and Risk Management of Three Regional Health Information Organizations in New York State. So, uh, you know, I think the, the purpose of this paper was to document the process and the outcome of health information exchange uh, health information exchange use case in three New York regions. And I think that the key, there are a couple key points here. So um, let's say, actually, I'm on the wrong page of my notes. All right. So, um, in a, so a, a couple of the key points that I thought were interesting. So one is we all know what the pitfalls are or the risks are associated with health information technology projects, right? So we have one right now and um, not sleeping at night because of the things that can go wrong, right? So we know that, you know, sometimes the specifications come late or sometimes you get the specifications on time but they're wrong and then the programming is taking more time than you think and you don't have enough time for testing and so all of these things. So you would have all of these same issues in um, a health information exchange project but on top of that you have this uh, public-private partnership, there's public funding supporting these, so you have even more stakeholders very often who are involved. Um, if an election happens during the project, everyone on the project may change. So what is that going to do? Like if everyone on my project that we're working on now walked out tomorrow, I would freak out. So. <laughs> Um, then, but also um, with uh, public projects, there's very often um, very prescriptive uh, deliverables, milestones, budgets, and uh, we know with these very complex technology projects, you have to be agile, you have to be flexible. So it sort of, you know, creates a situation where it's difficult to be successful. So, you know, what uh, Andy and his team said that there are two characteristics they found that were associated with successful um, health information exchange implementation. One was a strong organizational vision, and the second was agile decision making. And both of those, I think, make a lot of sense. They said that a strong health information exchange governance model is needed to minimize risk and to maintain stability over the course of the project. Nice job, Andy. Oops, am I going backwards? No. Okay. We have to do something about this mouse next year. <laughs> okay, so this is a usability um, study out of the UK entitled Verbal Protocols for Assessing the Usability of Clinical Decision Support, the Retrospective Sense-Making Protocol. And so their purpose was to compare two usability techniques. So a lot of you have probably heard of Think Aloud protocol. So they were comparing um, Think Aloud versus retrospective sense-making protocol for evaluating the usability of a clinical decision support tool. And so um, 
you know, think aloud is, you know, while you're completing a task, you're talking about what you're doing as you're doing it, as you're thinking, and this um, helps to test short-term memory. It's a standard protocol. It's very often used in uh, human factors research. The retrospective, re retrospective sense-making protocol involves the end user retrospectively watching a film or a video of them using the system. And then after the task is completed, they, you know, um, do an analysis of their behavior. So this process involves both short-term and long-term memory. And so what they found in this study was that um, both procedures identified the majority of usability issues. Um, they, they both did a really great job with that. But they found that the um, retrospective sense-making protocol was the most effective in identi identifying usability problems with a cognitive dimension. And uh, Think Aloud was better at identifying problems that are directly related to a behavioral task. So um, if you are looking at how somebody's searching, uh, the Think Aloud might be fine with that. But if you want to interpret problems with the search results, then the retrospective sync um, retrospective thinking, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, sense-making protocol would be better. Sorry about that. I have to blame it on lack of sleep with this uh, technology project. <laughs> Okay, so um, the next category is other. So these were papers that didn't really neatly fit into the other categories. Um, this one is provider to provider electronic communication in an era of meaningful use or review of the evidence. And so this particular paper came out of Columbia University. Sarah's one of the co-authors. And um, what, they, what they did is they, they, they tried to assess the impact of provider-to-provider -provider electronic communication tools on communication and health outcomes. And um, the key points here are that there are relatively few studies that look at this issue. I think they found 25 papers total. All of them um, evaluated provider-to-provider um, -provider communication, and they focused on physician providers. None of them focused on nursing providers, and none of them really focused on patient outcomes. So, you know, the um, key takeaway is that we do need more studies looking at nursing, communication tools between nurses and other providers and nurses and patients, and what the impact of those tools are on patient outcomes. And then the last study that uh, we've included was uh, the first author is Dawn Dowding. Um, and this was a survey uh, entitled International Priorities for Research in Nursing Informatics for Patient Care. We presented this paper um, last year at MedInfo. Um, and I think what, what's interesting about this uh, paper is there have been a series of surveys looking at nursing informatics research priorities. I think Patty Brennan published the first one in uh, 1998. And then in 2008, uh, Sue Bakken presented a, or um, published a paper on nursing informatics priorities and nursing outlook. Some of you might be familiar with that one. That was an award-winning paper. Um, so, but to our knowledge, this was the first one that looked at international priorities. So we had, uh, we surveyed uh, people from all the W World Health Organization regions. And um, we found that there was broad agreement related to the uh, two most highly ranked and the two most low, low ranked uh, priorities. And the highest ranked priorities were development of systems to provide real time feedback to nursing and assessment of health information technology impact on nursing care and patient outcomes. So just to summarize uh, you know, the, the literature for this year, in 2013, nursing informatics research was published on a wide variety of topics in informatics, nursing, and healthcare journals. So the, the work's getting out there. The most common research topic, as it was last year, is terminology and standards. Um, but we found several gaps. So one of the gaps was that uh, there are very few research publications related to the development of systems to provide real-time feedback for nurses and patients. So this is something that nurses told us worldwide that they want, and we need more um, papers on that. We also need more research on the assessment of health information technology impact on nursing and patient outcomes. So specifically, we need to have research on clinical decision support for nurses and on communication technologies and uh, nurses using that with nurses, with other providers, and with patients. And we need more, um, more studies on data mining. <laughs> 
There are a couple um, methods gaps as well. So for example, we found very few papers on evaluation or comparative effectiveness of health IT interventions. Most of the uh, studies we talked about were either a survey, they were case studies, or um, they were qualitative. So you know, we have some of that work with, that provides a really terrific foundation, but we need to start to do some effectiveness studies. And then there's also a measurement gap. So there, we, we need to look more at relevant patient-reported outcomes. So what outcomes are important to the patient, and how do we start to integrate those into the work we're doing so that you know, we learn what's important for us to learn, but we also learn what's important to the patient so these uh, systems will be used in practice. So with that, I have a series of questions. We can actually have an open discussion. Um, the first question I want to ask, though, is there anyone here who published a research paper in 2013 that related to nursing informatics that we didn't talk about? No, OK. Did anyone who's sitting here publish a paper, but it wasn't a research article um, and, uh, in the last year? Okay, Sharon, great. Okay, we have a couple, a couple of people. How many, put your arms up high, let's see. Yeah, we have a whole, okay, great. So this is more than we had in the audience last year, right, that had published papers. How many of you plan on publishing for next year? Come on, more than that. <laughs> Okay. All right. So it's good to see that you know people are um, are thinking about publishing, and that NENIC members are publishing in the informatics literature. Last year, we did uh, conduct a workshop where we did some mentoring with people who had done posters at um, NENIC and uh, encouraged them to turn those into papers. And I would imagine that we're probably going to do that again this year, right, Mary? Okay. So which of these studies uh, do you think have relevance for your own practice? Was there anything that Sarah or I talked about that you think is uh, relevant for where you're working? While you're, while you're thinking about that, I'll, I'll comment on the um, study that Sarah talked about with the infection control. So you know, we're implementing iPads at the bedsides in the oncology units and ICU, and our go live is June 9th, and one of the many approvals we had to get was the infection control nurses at the Brigham and also at Dana-Farber. And um, it is not easy to get approval, nor should it be. But I was so happy when I found that article. And it has, there's actually an app that you can download on your iPad. And if you clean it appropriately, it, the iPad turns a certain color. So you can tell. So um, with the article that uh, you can download that on. So I want you all to download that particular one. Uh, it's, uh, so I did that, and I presented that to the infection control nurses. I wrote up the policy based on that paper. And so that one's implemented into practice at the Brigham today. And I was really happy that we had to do this project because it saved me. <laughs> What other uh, articles did you hear about that uh, you think would be useful in your own practice? Yeah. For me, it's the, uh, the data mining and the patient engagement. As we move across the continuum, how will the care team in the physician's office interact with the patient around you know, meeting triple aim objectives and mm -hmm. Yeah, those are some interesting research questions. Yeah, excellent. Anyone else have ideas for practice? Yeah, the, um, yeah. the ED barcode medication administration one jumped out at me because uh, I don't know about you guys, but we're struggling with um, boy, patients in the emergency room. So they're really in patients, but they happen to be hanging out in the ED. So yeah. to me, what, what was um, interesting there is that we sometimes put these artificial parameters based on environments of care around mm -hmm. care delivery. Um, you know, the needs are the same, so those patients' needs that are in the ED are really equivalent to the patients of the inpatient unit. So I'm happy to see that research in the proposed remix. Yeah, and I think it would be interesting to talk to Nancy to find out, you know, what kind of changes. So this paper 
it was published in 2013, which means she probably finished it in early 2013 or, or before. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, what kind of changes did they make in their um, EHR and the ED after this to try to improve practice and uh, to make the technology less of a barrier. Yeah. that are uh, a significant number of our boarded patients in the ED and the things that we've been doing to try to meet those obstacles and challenges, challenges and obstacles mm -hmm. to try to have some measure of success with those patients. And I had seen that poster last year and I forgot to quote that article now. Yeah, so it's a great article. That. You know, mm -hmm. that, what, are we, what should we do and what do we need to do kind of thing for good patient care? Mm -hmm. you know, we may need to do meaningful use, but what we should be doing really sometimes Right, and sometimes with these usability issues, it's just small things. Like maybe there just needs to be a systematic process for who's going to change the batteries, right? I mean, there are things that, but anything in a clinical unit is, comp is complex, so you have to look at the whole unit. And I, that's why I just love that paper. I think it's a really thorough analysis of all the things that can go wrong, um, and each one needs a fix. Okay. Any other uh, thoughts about practice? Interesting. So those are some good research questions. You can uh, maybe do some focus groups with uh, you're, you're targeting both physicians and, and patients or and public. Yeah, interesting. Denise, did you have? Um, well, mine is uh, really speaks to the gaps that you talked about. You talked mm -hmm. about this gap um, in the literature around the impact of HIT on nursing and yeah. patient outcomes. And I guess it's a sort of a, a cry out to our community. We're about you know, within this, you know, in the eastern part of the state to undergo, you know, some massive implementations. <clears throat> Our colleagues at BMC are, you know, doing an implementation in just a few days. Partners and starts next year. Leahy is going off. And we have an incredible opportunity now to um, try to um, evaluate, address this gap and evaluate impact. So, where everybody, um, you know, didn't raise their hand. Uh, 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 you know, I guess I would encourage you all to look at the implementations that are about to happen in your, your areas and say, well, you know, it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. big. It can be focused and look at in your particular area, you know that there's an implementation that's about to happen. Um, what is something that I could take a look at um, mm -hmm. and perhaps evaluation of a, a sort of a pre and post or, mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was going to add that comment. I mean, I think Liz Johnson spoke to it this morning in terms of just as part of your implementation uh, and, and looking at systems, uh, benefits realization, system optimization, it's so helpful to have some measures before you implement. And as long as the implementation doesn't go on for years, in which case your pre data is not <coughs> valid, Try to get some measures of, of your desired outcomes. Try to get some measures of that before you implement so that you can have some sort of comparison. Yeah, those are great points. And I know I could hear the groan in the room because, <laughs> because and, you know, I groan too because we just don't know how to find the time to do this because we're planning for uh, transformation, we're planning for implementation, mm -hmm. we're trying to plan for training. There's all kinds of work going on, and we're too busy to do this. But what an opportunity we have right now in yeah. this community to identify um, some part where in your area, where you are, where you could uh, take a look at this. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds great. I wonder if it's a good topic for an ENIC <laughs> meeting, you know, to kind of brainstorm on what could be some simple ways to measure. Yeah. 
I was just struck actually by Sarah when you said I, this study came from a hunch I had. So I mean, how many of us as nurses have had hunches about things? Yeah. And I mean, we've seen that in some of our peer review cases where a nurse just starts, there's the vital signs, there's the comments, and they're trying to kind of get attention. And so, you know, your study, boy, we've seen that in our, in our facility. So, I mean, how many of us, if we just follow yeah. the hunch, could Right, the best clinical questions come from our own practice, right, wherever that is. And I will add, so, so that's a data mining study, right? Data mining is, is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. It's just analysis of what data you have there. So you find a statistician and tell them what you're looking for. And it doesn't have to be a huge amount of data, and it, it doesn't have to take that long. Thank you. I wonder if I might the International Council for Nurses at the conference in Seoul, Korea in June of 2015. I serve on the telehealth advisory board and uh, we're looking for research that is designed to support nurses. Sorry, I have my back. <coughs> Great. Are we out of time, or I don't know what? We have 10 minutes? Oh, OK, good. All right, any other? Yeah. Yeah, those are great comments. And I think we will add to that and say, if we kind of look at a group of these studies together, um, so there was the study then about the types of information patterns that influence patient outcomes and different information patterns that influence different outcomes. Um, and then that, that one also that was saying, you know, I think they were both focused on handoff, that there's not that knowledge and wisdom transfer in handoff. So if we look at the studies together, you know, how can that inform how we might build better tools and maybe, um, you know, what I would take away from that is we don't want to overstructure everything. And so maybe we can find these right communication dynamics that we can build into the system to promote that discussion. But it doesn't have to be all structured data necessarily. And we have to involve other disciplines besides physicians. So, you know, there, I think looking at the gaps in the papers, we can start to see, all right, so what is it about the tools that we have that hopefully would um, make better handoff or uh, better tools in general. Yeah, and, and keep in mind what is it that we're trying to accomplish with what we're doing. And the ICN and the Telehealth Advisory Committee were looking at accomplishing goals that are relevant to the World Health Organization mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's broad, but narrow as well, and mm -hmm. fun. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about barriers, okay? So all of us are about to undergo implementation. So what are the barriers to doing a study on this topic? Since we all have a subject. <laughs> Says the project manager in the back. <laughs> Okay, and so what are some strategies we can use to overcome those barriers? <laughs> Says the project manager in the front. <laughs> so we can't just talk about barriers. So what are some strategies? So that's true. Time, I think, is a huge one, right? There's so much to do with this implementation, and, you know, the vendor has their schedule of things we must do and the meetings we must have, and by the time we get through with all those, you know, we are a little tired and we'd like a break. But uh, what are some ways we could overcome some of those barriers? Work in collaboration. <laughs> yeah. Certainly yeah, I mean, I, I like the idea of making this a topic of a NENIC meeting and having people 
you know, brainstorm on, all right, what would be a simple way? What is something that we could measure? I mean, there's different le levels you can measure, right? So one of the studies had that uh, IC survey. So at the very least, do a baseline and a follow-up survey, and you'll have some data, okay? That might be all you can manage, but maybe, you know, if we brainstormed about the different levels you might measure impact and then have some options um, and people were collaborating, it might make it a little bit easier. It's very hard to do these things by yourself, right? You need to have a team. Wow. And we're not a hostel like you would think, you know, we're not an academic hospital. So it's really been amazing. And uh, so we love students and we definitely capitalize on their knowledge and their ideas. So that's a super key. That's a great idea. So you, there's always students who need projects. There's probably, how many students are in this room that are looking for a project? <laughs> No one's going to raise their hand, but I have the perfect, <laughs> we have the perfect project for you. Pick a hospital. <laughs> Any other comments about barriers or ways to overcome them? Yeah, Mary. I always thought one of the things, like, look at funding. You know, and I was wondering, is there a way within this group that we could use NEAC as a vehicle to push out, you know, these are groups that have funding available? You know, and basically so people can see, oh, maybe this is a small study like through a and or some other group. Because I think a lot of people don't have access to that. You know, mm -hmm. is that something that we should look at? Um, I think the other thing is, you know, I think that one of the biggest challenges for people, because there's so much on their plate, but also how do you, um, without, you, you don't want to boil the ocean. Right. For, you know, a cup of tea. So are there, you know, a couple of things that we could get, like a couple of tools that we could get, like recommended but keep it small, you know, and keep it focused, you know, on the things that nurses are always involved in, like slips and like falls, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, skin care, you know, and could we have like a little niche corner, you know, that might be something we want to look at, you know, here are, here is the recommended method, a tool methodology that you could implement easily, that it mm -hmm. wouldn't take a lot of work, but that we still have validity. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and there are some studies you can do um, retrospectively. So um, I think it was two years ago, Don Dowding published a paper in Jamia that looked at the impact of, uh, she did a study in, uh, at Kaiser looking at the impact of the EPIC rollout on um, falls, pressure ulcer documentation, and then the actual outcomes. And uh, that was some, that's something that she did kind of after the fact and did sort of a time controlled for time in her analysis so it was based on all the data from the EHR so there are these kinds of things too that you can do um, I think that's an article we can put up today and have a lot of interest <laughs> yeah but it wasn't published in 2013 so it no, didn't no, make the big board <laughs> yeah no I agree that's a great it's a great one there aren't a lot of studies that look at the impact of health information technology on nursing sensitive outcomes that's one of the few so it's a really good one to look at. Or even to use your, your recommendations for the future if you can use this one example. Like we could probably dedicate a page and say, you know, these are the things, and here's, a, here's a, an example of like, you know, yeah. an outstanding article that addressed this, and you, know, you might stimulate thought. Yeah, that's a great idea, sort of linking the articles that have done some of this with, yeah, I like that idea. Any other ideas about overcoming barriers? I think it sounds great, right? Yes. Okay, yes. The uh, question was, is there a way that Nina can support 
a matchmaking between students who need projects and organizations that um, want projects done. So we have a lot of people representing organizations here who are about to roll out an electronic medical record that would like to measure impact. And we haven't had a lot of students admit that they're students and need a project. We have one. <laughs> Maybe the students in the audience don't like the project that we're lined up. <laughs> But um, I think that's a great idea. Can I take a step further, too, for those of us who are students, but you know, who are practicing in the environment of informatics, just even hooking up with a neuroscientist to be able to help flush out. To like think it pieces, through. Like, mm -hmm. you know, formulating the survey so you're asking the right question in the right way so you get the right information, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, you go from, I have this grand idea to, OK, let's bring it down, you know. And right. Like I said, don't boil the ocean. Let's you know, keep it simple. So like, even those right. things. So, you know, we may sit around the office and say, oh, I'd love to do a study on that. You know, we have this grand idea, but just helping us to bring it down to something we actually can do. You know? Yeah, that's a great idea. Because so the, the comment was that could Nenik, um bring together people who are interested in doing projects and link them up with nurse scientists, nurse researchers. And absolutely, there's many on the uh, Nenik, uh, in Nenik. That's a great idea. So we have an alliance meeting coming up. That would be a good topic to bring up. Excellent. All right, so uh, time, our time is up. I've been informed, <laughs> and so I need to wrap up. But thank you all. This was great.